episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Joanna Bench, uh, who is founder and chief executive officer of the Longevity Center, which is a, uh, a boutique preventative health and longevity medical organization uh, focusing on both scientifically and medically advanced technologies and protocols. Uh, for healthy longevity and sustainable health. Uh, Joanna is also the founder uh, and CEO of the International Institute of Longevity, uh, which is a uh, international organization with offices both in Poland and Liechtenstein, uh, focusing on developing healthy longevity agenda in Europe by identifying, highlighting, and promoting various solutions and technologies uh, to prevent chronic age-related diseases. Uh, she co-founded that in partnership with uh, Prince Michael of Liechtenstein, and over her career, uh, she has spent time in various business development roles, both uh, regionally and, uh, and internationally, uh, with a number of Fortune 500 companies across both Central and Eastern Europe, uh, including the uh, the Architectural Engineering Group, the PM Group. Uh, she's worked at Lockheed Martin uh, for the uh, Geopolitical Intelligence Services, also uh, founded by, by Prince Michael. Uh, Joanna has served as the Vice Chairman and Board Member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Poland uh, and was responsible for the development and leadership of the uh, American Chamber of Regional Officers, both in Krakow and Wrocław. Uh, Joanna holds a Master of Arts degree in German Studies from University of Wrocław, uh, Diploma in Strategic and International Marketing at Dublin Business School, and completed Advanced Management Program at University of Navarra in Barcelona. A lot of interesting topics to talk about. Uh, Joanna Bench, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you very much for the invitation, Ida. Thank you. It's 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 wonderful having you. And you know, I was mentioning in the in the beginning, you have a, a quite broad uh, background in your career. I'd love to hear a little bit uh, more about your story of when uh, longevity uh, and, and sort of healthy aging became um, a target of yours during your career. Well, um, I think healthy lifestyle was always part of my part of my life. And um, so despite the fact that I was working for many international companies and also very much on the corporate, uh, in the corporate world, I was always interested in my personal development in, uh, in also what I eat and um, various aspects that actually make me being more effective, being more happy, being more um, vital and, uh, and, um, uh, and enjoy life. So um, I think this was always somewhere um, around me. It's just at some stage uh, in my career, I could see that, um, you know, being effective takes more of my, uh, of my um, health <laughs> and my, um, let's say it, it takes, uh, it, I have to spend more time to, uh, to, to, to be effective. And, um, and also I could really see how stress influences uh, my, uh, my day-to-day -day, um, vitality, but also my head. And, um, and then, you know, with Prince Michael, we really wanted to set up something related uh, with, with health in one si on one side with lifestyle. Uh, but I don't remember now the first time when I came across longevity sector, but really, um, it was about five or six years ago, but really it um, brought together everything that I, uh, I was interested in. What makes us um, actually um, look younger, despite the fact that um, we are the same age. You, you, you see 40 years old being looking like 60 years old and behaving like 60 years old. And, and, and you see some of them that, uh, that never... Um, that uh, uh, never grew up of grew, uh, you know never grew up and um, so I think it's uh, it's something that really I was uh, very impressed by um, it, combining different aspects of um, science technology and also medicine that um, could help us uh, understanding why we age in different uh, in, in different ways why we uh, why we are feeling um, healthier or less, health, uh, less healthy despite our genetic predispositions. 
And also the, the whole aspect of epigenetics. This is sure. a very fascinating uh, area. And what I really love about the sector is, is the aspects of hallmarks of aging and really understand the causes rather than only focusing on the effects. And, um, and being in the sector, also starting with the Institute, with um, getting to know, you know, various very important people in the sector, very intelligent uh, um, experts and that um, are very spe specialized in their area. We have seen that there was not really yet enough practical applications into the medical field and also a combination of psychology, medicine and science. This is something that we are very, very um, passionate uh, with. And uh, this is how the center uh, came up to life, came, came to life, um, that um, we brought on board a number of doctors that were already interested in this field mm -hmm. um, and um, are making sure that they are well-trained and also they get the right access to where the technology and science is going to help us to uh, to build really um, what is now the basis for longevity medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and speaking of the um, first, I guess, of the, the International Institute of Longevity, uh, you uh, recently put together this 27-page uh, this report. It was entitled um, Toward Lifelong Vitality. And as you mentioned, you brought together uh, scientists, entrepreneurs, economists, some government folks. Talk a little bit, just if you would, uh, some of the highlights that you learned during this process and, and sort, of the, sort of the synopsis within that report. Yeah, I think these meetings are really, really important. They are, they are, uh, this is part of the uh, Longevity Institute. We organize um, um, roundtables, which mm -hmm. are usually a very close um, Chatham House rules meetings of um, up to 25 experts in the field and trying to really bring um, experts that are looking at the particular topic from various points of view. So in this case, we had um, um, experts from science, which are mm -hmm. uh, focusing really on, on the scientific improvements in the sector, but also investors, also regulators, also insurance companies, uh, also doctors and, um, and representative, uh, for example, from WHO, which are very important influencers on where the field is going or, or European Commission. And um, really to talk where, um, uh, where we are today in terms of um, longevity sector in Europe, but also where the field is, um, is going to go in the future. How to make sure that some of this longevity, um, longevity sector um, ideas will be introduced into EU programs that would also support, be supported by you know, fin financing more uh, programs uh, both um, on the research side but also on practical implementations how we can also um, influence the insurance sector so that mm -hmm. uh, we will be finding the right way to um, to, um, to, to, to to promote preventive uh, prevention and also the, the, the right lifestyle and how can this be also translated into practical uh, solutions into the insurance sector so this was our first roundtable. This is again, we are uh, meeting either in Vaduz in Liechtenstein or um, because of COVID, the next um, roundtables um, were taking place online. Mm -hmm. One of them was focusing on biomarkers of aging, for example, where we had uh, really top experts in the field from um, Dr. Um, Eric Vardin to Dr. David Sinclair and also many other um, experts that are already um, focusing on um, practical uh, solutions for um, whether epigenetic plugs or any other ways to measure biological aging. Mm -hmm. And also to see where we are with those biomarkers, how can those biomarkers be translated into the medical field um, or whether, you know, how close are we to that? Because so far, none of the biomarkers of biological age have been actually um, converted into medical devices. Most of them are still uh, wellness, uh, wellness devices, which was, we are still using because we are also using all sorts of, you know, kind of um, whether um, devices like Garmin or Aura or other ways to measure our sleep, stress, exercise. They're also not medical devices, but they're helping both doctors and 
patience to um, to uh, stay motivated and uh, to focus to measure their on, on measuring their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so there was uh, what we have created in this first report is also kind of a swap analysis uh, analysis in terms of you know strengths, weaknesses, and uh, and also the potential potential for development of the sector. And um, it's available on our website for anyone that is interested. Uh, to see where it is. This was two years ago. Um, I don't think um, the sector has changed much, although there's definitely in the last two years much more interest in terms of investment, investors, finance, and also new venture capitals that sure. are coming, focusing on the sector. Uh, but we are still um, struggling with, um, uh, with financing science um, um, and especially enough uh, practical applications. So some of the challenges are still the same, but um, I think there's many more opportunities than uh, what we have seen uh, two years ago. I agree with you on that. And I encourage everybody watching and listening to go download this report at the website. It's it's very comprehensive and it's very attractive looking too. It's a, it's a very nice publication. So uh, okay. definitely, I think everybody should should take a look at it because it, it really is a comprehensive syn synopsis. Um, it's moving to the, the longevity center. So you set up the first in, in Warsaw, you know, sort of defined as this precursor uh, for uh, Central and Eastern Europe in terms of a preventive health and lifestyle intervention and, and everything you have outlined there. It's so comprehensive, as you were mentioning, you go from sort of the, the epigenetics and the genetics and the uh, biomarkers on up to cognitive health, emotional health, uh, more physical sort of posture assessments, really very comprehensive. Talk a little bit about sort of um, the the structure of this first um, clinic. And then I also you know mentioned that uh, you're gonna be opening a couple in Germany soon. And as I think the prediction is something like 20 for, for Europe in the next five years. Walk us through a little bit of, of what's gonna be happening. It's really exciting. Well, with this first center, we really wanted to do a proof of concept um, of uh, creating our client journey to see um, what kind of uh, what kind of clients uh, will be open, attracted, and uh, and also willing to introduce um, this program into their life? Um, we focus mainly on um, on clients between I would say thirty to uh, sixty five and beyond. But actually, most of our clients at the moment are around thirty five to sixty. Uh, because this is where you see actually the biggest change in your life. This is why you already start seeing that, um, you know, despite the fact that you do exactly the same, your outcome uh, might be more difficult to achieve and that you, you start, I don't know, gaining weight. Or now with, um, with uh, COVID especially, we see uh, that a lot, of, um, a lot of people that were usually very active started having, you know, depression of brain fog and, mm -hmm. and also side effects that they, they, um, they didn't expect, obviously, and didn't know how to deal with. And um, or we have clients coming to us because they lost lack of purpose. And then what, which doctors do you go to with lack of purpose? Right. Um, no, but in general, uh, the idea for the center is to um, to be really a point of um, contact and kind of a benchmark for mm -hmm. um, for longevity and healthy lifestyle. What is if you want to start with your um, with your personalized journey? Um, we assess where you are today, um, and as you mentioned, this is a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of uh, both your physical but also your emotional, your cognitive, your, um, uh, but also we're assessing microbiome, your mitochondrial health, and aspects that you're normally not um, evaluated by, uh, by, your, um, by your family doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a more comprehensive assessment where we are today to see what are the risk factors, uh, not only um, uh, to see what is already uh, a potential problem in your, in your health, uh, but also what are the potential risk factors that uh, without any um, intervention uh, could actually be problematic in a year or two or five years from now. Like you, men you mentioned posture alignment. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our clients want to start changing their lifestyle and they you know, buy nice shoes and they start running without actually checking whether this is a good way of um, a physical activity for yeah. them. So... 
before we do that, our physiotherapists and also our, our, our doctors are looking at your, on one side, your posture, also your, um, your feet, uh, whether you need any corrections in your overall posture, uh, your body mass density, but also we do 3D scan of your, of your, of your body to see actually what corrections do we need to improve, um, introduce before we recommend to you the right, um, uh, the right um, uh, physical exercise. And um, the same with diet, with your metabolic health. Um, most of the, cl the clients that we have in the center have problems, some kind of problems with hormonal or metabolic health. Mm. It's because of the type of, um, because of so much stress also caused by COVID, uh, but also the quality of, of food uh, or, or decisions in terms of uh, type of food that we that we are eating or were eating in the past. Um, a lot of our clients have problems with microbiome, or um, uh, or at least there is room for improvement. And this is something that we can do with diet, but also with uh, the right probiotic, uh, probiotic and prebiotic therapy. And, um, and also, you know, food intolerances. So this is all kind of interconnected because if you measure just one of those aspects, then you don't get the full picture. For example, if you measure only food allergies, which some people do, uh, you might actually, if you have leaky gut, you might be allergic to everything you eat, which doesn't give you, you know, the right information of what to yeah. do with that because um, it's, it's not solving the problem. So first in the combination with other markers, you see really some of the uh, root causes of, um, of, of current uh, problems. The same with cognitive uh, health. Uh, we are working with, um, with a very good specialist in terms of sleep expertise, but also cognitive health and assessing both the, um, your cognitive performance, uh, reaction time and your um, your, um, uh, how your brain function works today, but also assessing your uh, sleep quality. And uh, this is what we do on the kind of with the medical um, grade um, um, uh, solutions. So it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a medical, uh, medical advice. Uh, and uh, especially after COVID, a lot of people have some kind of um, sleep problems. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize how sleep is affecting also our metabolic health. And it could be also that metabolic health is influencing our sleep. So this is totally interconnected. Um, so these are aspects that are evaluated separately, but then we have a consilium of experts, uh, mainly doctors and, and nutritionists, that are um, discussing every client and uh, preparing the personalized uh, recommendation for the next uh, three, six or 12 months. Uh, usually, this recommendation start with just one or two main aspects, because if we go with a whole big change, list of changes, uh, nobody will actually want to follow it. So it usually starts with the first step. Um, and, um, and, and then the idea is really to uh, also see how your biological age is changing in the process of certain interventions, because as part of the assessment, we have about eight different uh, ways we measure biological aging. So we are measuring your um, epigenetic clock, uh, but also um, your cognitive, your brain, uh, brain age, your uh, cardio age, um, um, something called glycan age, which is a very nice, sure. very interesting marker for uh, for inflammation in your uh, in your system, which could be caused by various different uh, uh, things. But first, when we have um, different uh, results, we can actually say what would be the main uh, aspect that influ that influences it, and uh, and also your uh, immune uh, immune age, which uh, is one of the most important at the moment in the in the, especially in the time of COVID. Yep. You want to make sure that uh, your immune system is uh, strong enough. It's uh, it's fascinating to hear go, going through this whole program because you know the uh, as you mentioned personalization, but also you know extremely uh, complex process of aging, and, you, and it's nice to see an organization like yours bringing sort of both of these things together. Um, you know, I I really uh, you recently 
uh, gave a talk at uh, the, the Aging Research and Drug Discovery Conference. It was entitled Personalized Longevity in Practice, where you, uh, once again, you went through a comprehensive overview of, of, uh, of what you have going on. And, and, and in, uh, in this presentation, you know, while you talk about all the opportunities as you have now, you also talk about some of the challenges and um, some of the things that you highlighted in, in that presentation, you know, how we make these comprehensive tools widely available, uh, how we get a lot of these companies, hundreds of companies involved in aging now, how we get them to collaborate a little more. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the challenges per 2022 that, and looking out a bit that you still are dealing with as you set up this new model. Well, this is definitely for us, I see a lot of opportunities at the moment, because as you mentioned earlier, we are entering now a German market. Yep. Uh, we are actually entering in a different way than Poland, because Poland is a center in the middle of the uh, of, of the city in a very modern uh, office setup. But uh, in Germany, we are going to be in a, uh, in a five-star hotel, in one of the top hotels uh, in the south of Germany, nice. um, where um, it's, a, it's a very um, also interesting model of combining hospitality and, uh, and, uh, and medicine, where, um, you know, going to a doctor, we don't uh, always consider to be a high-level experience. I mean, it's usually... Uh, a need or is something that we are afraid of and here we're trying to also make health um, as fun on one side but also um, um, easy easy easier available mm. and also make it uh, make it a high level uh, experience on the other side we are also trying to and this is something that we set up from the very beginning that we don't want to be only for the most exclusive group because this is also, I think, the negative aspect, the moment of the longevity sector that for some people it's considered to be only for the, the rich um, or the, the, the affluent group. Um, we are trying to be for, um, uh, also uh, reasonable in price and try to introduce more and more biomarkers that would be uh, widely available so that the access uh, point is going to become, um, you know, lower and lower, lower and lower. So uh, also in Germany, okay, this is, this is in a very, uh, very nice hotel, very, um, a very good location, but still we will be trying to be a more, um, cost effective than mm -hmm. some of our uh, colleagues in in um, around the world or, or trying to also attract different uh, group of of um, of clients we also emphasize that we focus on clients not patients mm -hmm. uh, I'll try um, to make sure that our clients don't became don't become patients if they uh, take care of themselves um, and challenges um, you know, like you, you mentioned that some of the, there is problem in collaboration. I think at the moment, I see actually a lot of collaboration in this field. And okay. I think this is one of the biggest potentials as well for the field to grow. Uh, that um, I have, a, um, um, you know, good, very good experience in, in working with a number of very interesting colleagues uh, from uh, Asia, US, um, different places in Europe uh, to actually share experiences and mm -hmm. to see how we can um, how we can actually uh, interconnect our our uh, our uh, results because um, you know like the, this are, we are very unique we have a very unique setup and some of our biomarkers have never been tested in the in the combination that we have set up for ourselves mm -hmm. as as the right, um, let's say, set of biomarkers. And um, and we would like to also share it with other companies that are doing something similar and connecting different biomarkers together so that we can actually um, have a much better um, results and, and also knowledge uh, and recommendation for potential intervention for, mm. for, for the clients for the future. So one of the biggest challenges and opportunities is also converting our um, results into AI solutions. This is what mm -hmm. we are currently working on. Obviously, now we are relying very strongly on um, experts that we are uh, employing and that we work with. But at some stage, with a certain number of, uh, of, of those markers that we are using, 
um, um, there's no, there's not going to be one doctor knowing it all. So we are uh, hoping to use um, to to use uh, a lot of e AI uh, solutions as well to. Uh, to give us better advice and recommendations, mm -hmm. and um, so I think this is where this is where I see uh, at the moment the, the field going. So it's it's very much going to be um, technology, um, interconnectivity, and uh, collaboration between various experts and both science and and, and medicine. Outstanding. Um, one of the areas, Joanna, the I noticed that you also um, have spent time uh, involved with the the all parliamentary the, uh, parliamentary group in the UK, um, mm -hmm. and you know it, it's interesting because you know in the uh, the lifelong vitality report, obviously you have people like Prince Michael. There was a a member from uh, Sweden's uh, trade ministry, I think, at that last conference. What are you seeing as you you sort of you network around the globe and meet with the, these folks in government and in sort of government positions as far as um, I, I guess one of the things I always hear is that, that at the end of the day, even you know, no matter how powerful sort of the pharma industry is and all the money, at the end of the day, we really need government, <laughs> big governments involved in getting on this longevity train to really fund yeah. the big, big projects at the end of the day. Where, where are we? I, obviously, you, you network and you're involved with a lot of these people at high levels of power. What do you see as far as uh, whether it's the UK government, Liechtenstein, Sweden, whatever, where, where are we going with this on this angle? I think the big challenge for governments was that, you know, like most of the people we talked to at ministries of, um, of um, development or minister of health, uh, you know, most of the ministers are very much for prevention, but everyone understands prevention in a different way. I think the biggest challenge was that uh, prevention is much more difficult to measure. So it's hard to measure something that it's, uh, it might happen, but it doesn't. So it's more like an insurance uh, that you are, Kind of doing something in case something will happen. Mm -hmm. So now with, uh, I believe that with biomarkers of aging and also biomarkers of biological age, this is a very interesting marker that actually can help us to measure prevention. So for example, how lifestyle, whether, whether the right intervention in your lifestyle are really bringing some of any effect so that uh, because only if you can, I think it's much easier to find out something that you can measure as a result. And, you know, with, uh, with different diseases, uh, that uh, chronic diseases that are currently very well financed, but as we know both, um, like there's, going, there's a lot of money going for cancer research and also for, um, for uh, Alzheimer research. And as we know, Alzheimer is it's one of those uh, conditions that doesn't have today. I, I think apart from just one drug that recently had a very um, good result, really we don't have um, anything that, uh, that can stop or prevent us from, uh, from, from, from this condition. And, um, and, and this is very sad, despite huge investment going into. And we know that prevention is actually one of those um, aspects that can um, either delay a risk of Alzheimer uh, with the right, um, with the implementation of the right lifestyle in the right moment, because Alzheimer, as we know already from many, um, many studies, uh, starts many, many years, like 20 years earlier. Uh, but um, it's very difficult to uh, to find the right moment and, and also to measure it. But knowing that most of those chronic diseases have the same cause or have the same, um, um, you know, hallmarks that are actually um, um, the root cause, uh, mm -hmm. which is related to aging. Um, I think this this is something that um, that gives uh, a lot of hope for the future for um, for maybe not solving all the problems, but maybe delaying some of those conditions with some of our clients. Um, and, and therefore, I think that the, the biggest challenge was that it was very difficult to, uh, to see how we can um, measure results mm -hmm. in, preven in prevention. Uh, in the last few years, these biomarkers of aging are really uh, popping out and there's more and more um, interesting solutions coming, um, becoming more com commercialized and available. And I believe this will be one of the most important ways to, um, to help us 
measure effects of uh, of of what we do in the sector and if we do that uh, it will be much easier to convince uh, the regulators uh, to implement programs financing and so on because then those uh, programs and those um, financing schemes will be able to be somehow measured and uh, validated mm. I think this is this is the biggest uh, problem that theoretically everybody says that prevention is important and uh, we have to have good lifestyle and but when you also talk to insurance companies like there's um, at the moment not I mean most of them are using wearable devices to measure effects of lifestyle or have their own applications that are helping their clients to motivate them to uh, to move and to uh, to eat healthier but uh, really, we don't have yet good programs um, that uh, that could be presented. So I think it's um, that there are so many discussions at the moment between the governments and also uh, the regulators about that. That um, I believe that in the next uh, few years, we hopefully in the next two to three years, we can really come with um, with very good ways of. Um, uh, of, of implementing programs that could be well validated. Excellent. Um, Joanna, we, you mentioned the, uh, obviously the Germany operation, many more clinics coming in the next few years. Uh, mm -hmm. Where else can, uh, where else can we find you in, in, in the next coming months into 2022, conferences you're going to be presenting at, meetings, talks you're going to be giving, anything else that you, you want to talk about? Uh, uh, aside from the clinics, please, I'll give you the floor. Well, definitely one of the, um, in Europe, one of the, um, um, one of the best uh, events is definitely ARDD uh, that mm -hmm. you have mentioned in Copenhagen. This is one of the best longevity conferences. And uh, now, uh, next month, we have um, Longevity Week coming up, uh, where okay. a number of different companies uh, and organizations are going to be inviting interesting speakers and presenting as well on um, progress in the field and also various aspects, you know, like the, I see more and more uh, people interested in, uh, in longevity, also from the context of uh, employers, for example, mm. um, also how to introduce it uh, to, uh, to companies and how to also um, uh, to, to attract more investors. And uh, I see those conferences also uh, evolving from being uh, strictly scientific to being more practical. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely uh, both myself and, and Prince Michael are very interested in practical applications. So we are going to do also um, um, still before the end of the year, we have a round table on practical applications in um, medical uh, field. Um, and in medicine and where we want to bring different um, clinics that are already operating in this area and share experiences um, as well and see how can we do joint, um, joint research and mm -hmm. uh, how can we share uh, knowledge. Um, and, um, and also hopefully, I, I hope the U.S. is going to open soon because there's a lot of very interesting conferences that were happening in the U.S., that in the last two years, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, we couldn't do. Uh, but um, for us, it's very important to bring more uh, of those uh, um, discussions into Europe because, uh, as you well mentioned as well, there's different countries uh, looking at how best to apply some of those longevity uh, solutions into also the uh, governance and, and uh, for the regulators. Uh, but very few uh, do. So mm. I think there's still a lot, a, a lot to do here. So we definitely are planning also uh, together with uh, Prince Michael a separate conference uh, in Germany on, on on longevity medicine, for example, and how to um, how to make it uh, both uh, effective, efficient, and also uh, how we should best work with uh, with governments. Outstanding. Outstanding. And we'll, we'll be reading you on and, and, and hopefully we'll see the, the news of the first longevity uh, center here in the U.S. as well. So very exciting time and wishing you the best with all of this, Joanna. Um, for, for everybody that 
uh, is going to be listening to this particular episode uh, on our podcast networks or watching uh, on our YouTube channel. You've been listening to Joanna Bench, founder and chief executive officer of both the Longevity Center and the International Institute of Longevity. Uh, Joanna, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Thanks for everything you're doing there. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us via what you're doing. Very inspiring talk. Thank you, Ira. Thank you very much.